this. The webinar is going to be recorded, um, and the recording will be made available along with the slides in the next two weeks. And second, I'd like to direct you to the top left of your screen where you see a box labeled information. There you'll find the link for live captioning, some audio information, and some troubleshooting tips. You can also write to me in the chat and I'll help you if you're having any issues with audio or anything like that, any tech, tech issues. There's also a group chat at the bottom left of the screen, which you've already gotten familiar with for participant discussion. And again, if you have any technical issues, please uh, write them in that chat and I'll help you. Uh, there will be a question and answer session at the end of the webinar, so please wait until that time to submit your questions to the panel, and you'll use the group chat box for that. And lastly, to ensure we get the most out of our time together, please avoid disruptions if you can. I know we're all busy, but I'm glad that you can take some time out today um, during Public Service Recognition Week, and um, hopefully you can uh, participate actively. And again, if you need anything, just ask for it in the chat. I'd now like to introduce you to today's panel moderator, Kathy Osvoff, a member of the faculty for the Federal Executive Institute. Hi, thank you so much, Katie. I'm really delighted to be with all of you today to moderate this discussion on mindfulness for feds with our distingu distinguished panelists. During Public Service Recognition Week, we want to thank you for all that you do in service to our nation. As you know, the American people count on the federal government every single day. As part of OPM's HR Solutions, our mission at the Center for Leadership Development is to develop visionary leaders to transform government. For over 50 years, we've helped government agencies meet their workforce education and development needs through interagency classes, custom programs, and online training solutions. Leadership skills, regardless of your position, are more critical than ever, and we hope you'll be able to take some information from this webinar back to your organizations to help you better meet mission demands and public expectations while maintaining personal wellness. So now let me introduce our panel members for today's webinar. Um, and by the way, while Katie is moving that slide, um, I love the comment I just saw in chat earlier that this amazing panel of experts has joined hands across agencies to support our federal employees. That is so true and now you'll see why. Um, first, we have Martha Ellen Florence, also a faculty member here at the Federal Executive Institute. Martha Ellen is our resident expert in diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. She's also the Director of Training and Leadership Development for the Presidential Management Fellows Program, among other things. Next is Heath Harding. Heath oversees our prestigious Leadership for a Democratic Society Program. He has over 20 years of experience helping emerging, emerging and seasoned leaders in public, for-profit, and nonprofit environments to help their leadership, help develop their leadership skills. We're also really excited to have two experts join us from other agencies. Michelle Rugebrink joins us from the U.S. Forest Service, where she serves as the Mindfulness and Resiliency Program Manager. Michelle is a master coach and has been featured in Mindful and Time magazines for her work around mindfulness-based stress reduction, or MBSR, and coaching. She's a certified MBSR teacher through the University of Massachusetts Medical School. She also serves as an adjunct faculty for CLD and is the Director of Education for the Federal Internal Coaching Program. And last, Garth Smelser has joined us today from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, where Garth oversees the Mindful NOAA program. He served 14 years in the U.S. Forest Service and eight years in the U.S. Navy. While co-founding the Mindful NOAA Community Movement, Garth received mindfulness facilitator training through the Engaged Mindfulness Institute. He also serves as an adjunct faculty for CLD. You can read each panelist's full bio on this webinar's registration page. So here's how today's panel discussion will unfold. I'll direct questions to each panel member, but we'll then ask for additional thoughts from the other panelists so you can hear everyone's unique perspective. And during the last 10 or 15 minutes, as Katie said, we'll take questions from the audience. 
So please hold your questions for that time and then we'll ask you to put those into chat. All right, we're ready to get started. Um, panelists, please go ahead and turn on your video cameras now. All right, I'm seeing everybody on screen. Waiting for Michelle, we're all there, fantastic. So, uh, you know, just to get started, uh, Michelle and Garth, I thought it might help the audience if you two would provide us with your definition of mindfulness. Michelle, why don't you go first? Well, thank you, and it's an honor to hold space here with everybody today. Uh, I'll say mindfulness is paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally. Wow. Okay, Garth, you want to add to that? Yeah. Can you can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It and and that is the kind of the gold standard of the mindfulness definition. And and I would offer a little bit more personal term about noticing your real world experience. Um, and a lot of new folks to mindfulness might say, well, what do you mean? I'm always noticing what's going on in my life. But science would tell us otherwise. Science would tell us that we're mind wandering about half of our waking life. And in that mind wandering time, we're tending to lean towards negativity. So half of our waking hours, mind wandering, ruminating, planning, preparing. And so mindfulness invites us to notice that and then come into a place of choice about how we respond in the next moment. That's really helpful. Martha, Ellen, and Heath, feel free to jump in if you have anything to add. No, I, I think they covered it. I, I only thing I would add is that it allows me to um, label my thoughts and actually identify what I'm feeling at that moment and be able to be very specific. So, and, and kind of gives me a, a, a feeling of sensation and I pay more attention to body and mind and, and spirit where I am in that day. Right, very good. Yeah, I think that those are all different perspectives, but, but really helpful. So just to set the stage for today's discussion, you know, as we all know, the past couple of years have been pretty intense. We've experienced an ongoing global pandemic, social and economic tensions, historic wildfires, and now the war in Ukraine. Not to mention that after juggling our home and work lives for over two years, we're beginning to return to the office across agencies in various ways and schedules. So it's no wonder that many of us are experiencing burnout, stress, and or anxiety. So Michelle, can you help us understand how mindfulness-based stress reduction programs can help us cope with all of these stressors? Yes. <laughs> and my hand's over my heart right now. You know, mindfulness-based stress reduction, MBSR, is available to help us cope with a range of stressors and anxiety through medical and science-based approaches. And there's the psychological resilience, and it can be learned through specific mindfulness practice. And it's been found to bolster our resiliency in the face of and in recovering from stress. So MBSR is a program that allows us to do experiential learning and to change our relationship to our stressors. We'll always have stress. We need to, we need it to wake up every day and to do our work it changes our relationship to our stressors. So people undertaking mindfulness training have shown increased activity in the area of their brain associated with positive emotions in the prefrontal cortex, which is generally less active in people who are depressed. And what we have seen is dramatic increase in being able to cope with stress. So improving our physical well-being and increasing work outcomes and productivity. And our first set of research out of 2,573 students, 29% had suffered from serious depression or suicidal thoughts and were given a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder within the prior six months of taking MBSR course. And 100% significantly improved their ability to cope with stress. So the MBSR program has taught, you know, that we teach uh, at USDA and the Forest Service and offered to all federal agencies is consistently taught, is a highly effective 
and positively affecting the workplace performance and dimensions as reported by students and participants. And these dimensions, they, they speak to the important relationship, being able to change our relationship to our stressors, having improved that physical benefits of positive work benefits. So thank you. Yeah, I love that. I love the idea of changing our relationship to stress. We have it, like you said, we're always gonna have it, but what do we do with it? Yeah, I love that. So Garth, do you have something you'd like to add to that discussion? Briefly, and I appreciate Michelle's summary of MBSR because that also is the gold standard of what brought mindfulness into the uh, modern Western mindset and got it launched into medical and research uh, sciences. So, but that's not the, that it's one of many hundreds, if not thousands of different ways of entering the mindfulness space. And not everybody has access to, you know, an eight week program. Um, uh, so there's all sorts of ways of coming at that. And we can explore it in our different ways. I think we're going to be talking about individual practices in a little bit. But MBSR is a really great one to research, to understand what has launched this modern mindfulness movement. But know that that's not your only entry point into mindfulness practices. Yeah, good point. So Garth, while I've got you, what are some common misconceptions that you have heard people say about mindfulness practice and what it is? <laughs> Um, faced in pop culture sort of with this blissed out zen-like person meditating there's so many uh, there's so much baggage that comes with it and the first one is I can't stop my mind from uh, working I can't meditate and that's the complete opposite of the intention it's noticing that the mind is active and you're a successful meditator our brain gets paid the big bucks to be distracted to protect ourselves from things going on in our day. So we don't want our mind to stop thinking. We want to be able to better notice and then respond to that thought process like Martha Ellen was observing. So rather than getting swept away by the internal weather going on in your mind, you can pull out and scale a little bit and notice what's going on with your thoughts, emotions, and sensations and say, how is this serving me? So that's the number one misconception that stops people from even entering this space is I can't stop my mind. And I say, good job. You're a human. Come on in and meditate with us. And I, I just want to add something to that, Barth, because in one of your sessions with Mindful Noah that I attended, one of my favorite things that you said was welcome to the party. And it was the idea of when those thoughts come in, you don't have to worry that you're doing something wrong. Just welcome the thoughts and then go back to your your breathing or your intentional practice. So I use that all the time. I think it was really, really helpful. So um, Keith and Martha Ellen. Taught me that phrase and I've, I've, I've lived it. <laughs> oh, lovely. I didn't know that, Heath. I'm glad that we learned that just now. So do you have anything to add, Keith? Yeah, that is such a great mind flip to say, oh, I need to keep things away and I need to, to stop thinking so negatively and say, gosh, welcome to the party and, and notice what's coming in. And as Martha Ellen was saying, then if I can notice it and name it, then I can actually do something with it or just literally just sit with it. Some Sometimes in our very do kind of culture we need to do or problem solve and sometimes with mindfulness the best is just to sit with it well said and feel free to jump in martha ellen if you have something else you would like to add as well no problem okay so before we move into um some examples of mindfulness in the federal space just briefly what do the latest published studies have to say about mindfulness practice in the workplace. Michelle, you touched on it briefly, but do you have something else you would, um, you could share with our audience? Yes, uh, and, and I wanna say thanks to Heath and Garth and, and sharing, um, I always say, welcome to the full catastrophe of living and, and notice your reaction to it. And uh, can we greet ourselves at the front door just the way that we are non-judgmentally? And that's such a gift. Um, and so going to the research, um, there, so 
while there's a, a total of like 39 scientific papers, they were published in the year 2000. Today, there's upward of over 6,000 papers exploring how mindfulness can help us with attention, employee well-being, to surgical performance, to test taking success in students, as well as pain management, depression, anxiety, and burnout, and other psychological and physiological concerns. And again, you know, there's, there's, and like Heath mentioned, there's so, and Garth, there's so many things that, whether you use MBSR, uh, is a foundation for similar programs like mindful-based cognitive therapy, uh, mindfulness, self-compassion, and over a dozen other stretchful mindful programs. And so there's a variety of special interests and needs. And, you know, I'll just say finally, why mindful-based stress reduction matters or mindfulness in general. Most people who dedicate themselves to an eight-week course or more, of the, the program find tremendous long lasting value in their daily life, both at work and at home. And, and I you know, also work closely with uh, Amishi John, she's a neuroscientist that's been working with the military for the last 15 years and with NIH. And information has been shared through NIH and the, with the support of using mindfulness as a tool to support our reaction to our stressors and our resiliency. And so just sharing a little bit about that, um, because I always say that there's two misconceptions about what, hair, who, and where mindfulness is practiced. And the first that, that mindfulness is a religious practice or a belief system or somehow mystical or spiritual. Mindfulness at its core is a very human practice that can be utilized in many endeavors, many professional settings. And these settings, again, have included military branches, professional collegiate sports teams, orchestras, businesses, and other governmental organizations. And I loved how Garth put it in there that welcome to the party. And he, yeah, here we are. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's a great segue to, to the next topic, which is, you know, let's talk about the current state of mindfulness offerings in the federal space. So I'd love for each of you to tell us what's going on and what you've witnessed that's going on in the federal space. And I'm gonna start with Garth because of the Mindful NOAA program that we mentioned earlier. If you could just start there and then we'll, we'll move around to each panelist. Important detail by, by COVID and I saw what was possible happening in the Forest Service. I went back to my agency and said, why not here? And from one single conversation with a colleague, we grew over the past two years into a by employees, for employees, community of practice initiative, where we have over 800 subscribers. We hold daily meditations and mindfulness space, and we've offered over 13,000 mindfulness-based engagements across about 500 um, different sessions and meditations. Again, not by an endorsed or resourced program, but, a, but a, an organic grassroots level program. You know, and then bookending on the other side with Heath and Martha Ellen inviting us into spaces like the Federal Executive Institute with the Presidential Management Fellowship Program as they saw the value of bringing performance and leadership development curriculum with the backdrop of mindfulness to their students. And so we're, we're not, as Michelle alluded to, we're not blazing any trails here in the federal government, the <laughs> private sector, sports teams, the VA, they've been doing this for 15, 20 years, knowing its value. And we're just now starting to um, create the space that why not here? And so I'm so very grateful for Michelle making me aware of what's possible. And then people like Heath and Martha Allen saying, we need this for our leaders in federal government. So Mindful NOAA is sort of uh, like the Forest Service is demonstrating what's possible. And we're hoping that other agencies can kind of jump on that bandwagon with us. Thanks, Garth. And since you mentioned Martha Ellen, I'm going to go ahead and switch over to Martha Ellen. And Michelle, I'll, put, I'll make you last so you can kind of bookend what's happening. Um, so Martha Ellen, go ahead. And then he. Yeah. Um, one of the things when, I, when uh, I was introduced to the mindfulness practice, I thought, ooh, this is really good because I came from in a 40 year environment of live television production. And so it was just fast, fast, move, 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 and never actually thinking to kind of slow down and to focus and to have sort of a, 
a, a calming effect and and it was just you know anxiety stressful situation I, and I, we thrived on stress and we always do when especially when we're talking about uh, television but then when I came to the federal government I'm like oh I, I can't keep this up otherwise um, I, I need some self-care so that's my first introduction to mindfulness and then thought um, when I brought it to the presidential management fellows you know our, our young emerging leaders they are so focused on being right and being successful and all these kinds of things that they need some way to actually kind of um, address their stress, um, kind of take down their anxiety of just being a, a new person in the federal government, you know, to actually uh, have greater satisfaction with the relationships that they're building and not have them uh, connected to stress. Um, also, uh, one of the other things that they, they really enjoy is we always do a, in the PMF program, we have a mindfulness point and then we do a wellness break, which is a mindfulness walk. So we encourage them to get out, to do some mindfulness work, to experience their body, to experience what they're seeing, what they're hearing, what they're smelling in just a short 15 minutes break. And you'd be surprised how energetic they come back and they're focused and they're, they're willing to learn. So um, we did, I do that with the PMF program. Then we also did it recently with our women's leadership program. And that was Michelle like took us to the moon. I don't know what she did, but it was amazing. So thank you, thank you. And it was more of, um, we did the things with body scanning. So with the women's leadership, the, the PMF program, they want, you know, immediate, you know, what, do you, what can you do for me now? Stress reduction. Women, on the other hand, were sort of kind of let's let's calm it down, let's explore, let's and that the term I use labeling. Let's label our emotions. Let's label what I'm feeling and and starting from their head down to their toes. So um, I can't I can't say enough about uh, the mindfulness practice, what Garth and Michelle have brought to the federal government, and I continue to find ways to use it all the time. Thank you, Martha Ellen, and one of you mentioned the walking. One of my favorite exercises that I was told about was um, the sound walk. And I often walk my dog in the morning. And in in when I focus on a sound walk, I'm actually listening to everything I hear around me. Where normally your mind is going a million miles an hour and you don't even hear the birds singing or the plane overhead or the dog barking. But the sound walk, you really focus and you keep bringing yourself back to that. And so you have that, that awareness of what's around you. And I find it um, really great practice. Keith, why don't you talk about what, what you've witnessed in the federal government? Yeah, thanks, Kathy. Um, gosh, it's I'm just um, doing a little uh, a fan love here of being in this space with everybody. So, um, and the, so I manage a program called Leadership for a Democratic Society. Um, it's for GS-15s and SESs, and um, one of the things that we've been doing mindfulness in that program unofficially by different faculty for uh, a, a good number of years, but we've never done anything um, official and in a session of bringing everybody together. We often teach different tools and uh, talk about mindfulness and how do you stop, you know, what's one of the, the best things leaders can do is actually stop um, and you know, think and assess themselves as well as the situation because we're moving so fast and we're going to miss some stuff. Um, and one of the things we see in that program is, and and most of us is how many times do you solve the wrong problem? And so in this program, when we think about leadership, we're often solving the wrong problem because we're jumping to assumptions or our biases get in the way. And so how do we 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 bring that back a little bit? And so Garth reached out to me and said, "Hey, I heard about this this program that you're running, and you know, want to talk to you about how mindfulness might fit in that program." And so um, we started um, working, and now Garth and other colleagues uh, come in and do an elective. Um, it's a three-hour elective on mindfulness, very similar uh, to what we're doing here, and just expanded. We we do practices as well as talking about the research and things like that. Um, and I just wanted to share, we had a participant, uh, I guess about six months ago, um, they were tracking their stress and their heart rate variability prior to the program because they knew that this was an issue, right? And so we have a wellness component around physical wellness and then they also took the mindfulness elective. And they went from an average of before the program of 18.3 
and they dropped it down to 12.7 of doing mindfulness and wellness based stuff. Um, and their stress were level based on this, this app that they were using dropped 31% uh, because of that. And this is a, a GS15 leader in the federal government. So, uh, and then just a shout out to, to Michelle, I just completed the MSBR cl eight week class and you know now find myself not doing a formal practice so much, but I catch myself taking deep breaths um, throughout the day, which is really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And Michelle, with that, why don't you wind us up, uh, finish up this part of the conversation with what your experience is in the federal government? Ah, deep breath in and slowly exhale out. Right. We should all do that right now. <laughs> Tapping into our portable equilibrium right here, right now. Uh, it, it's been a journey and um, I have happy tears. These are happy tears and hand over the heart constantly. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'll, I'll go back all the way to 1994 where um, I was involved in a catastrophic wildfire where we lost 14 firefighters. And um, how I saw and observed the pain and suffering of my colleagues and over the years thought, wow, this, this can't be how it is. You know, we, we need to be thriving. How do we serve the American public and the land? We need to be awake and present. And so I really realized they used to call me Red Bull in DC. And now I'm called chamomile tea, rooted in wisdom, when to know to use both. And so this has been a, a journey of um, doing the work on Michelle so that I can authentically hold that space with others and that it can be felt and seen. Uh, and so it was a journey going through occupational health and safety into research, into civil rights where it just flourished, and then into the work environment performance office, where now um, I've held the space with over 30,431 federal employees with mindfulness-based stress reduction. And we offer 15 minute guided breaks and we do monthly webinars that are one hour that are recorded with topics and shared with everybody. We've integrated mindfulness into our new employee orientation and leadership programs and beyond and how we support each other. You know, I like to say, we're not just a drop in the ocean, we're the entire ocean in one drop. And Martin Luther King Jr., he had it, just a beautiful quote, take the first step in faith. You don't have to climb the whole staircase, just take the first step. And, and I also use my master certified coaching skills to support the development of the mindfulness programs and how we compassionately hold each other with those powerful what and how questions. And as leaders, what is it we really need? What can we let go of? What can we hang on to? What is not serving us? So thank you. Wow. Um, thank you for that. It's very inspiring, Michelle. So if someone is interested in starting their own mindfulness practice. That might be a question that people have right now. After hearing all of this, um, they might say, I want some of that and how do I do it? And what advice would you give them? Garth, do you want to start off? of yourself start off with an intention of this way of being not this not this um, means of doing like Heath was talking about and so I, I would encourage you to research and and um, talk to other people about it think your way to a certain point and then just start experiencing it and doing it in a way that meets you where you are not say okay I'm gonna go away on a 10-day retreat and I'm gonna meditate in silence all day no maybe just have a mindful cup of coffee to start with Maybe just walk mindfully with your dog. You know, habit stack on things you're already doing so that you start to uh, see how mindfulness can be incorporated into your life instead of it being one more thing to do. Because then it's, then it's kind of counter to what its intentions are. So again, start slow, but regular. I think it needs to be um, as much of a regularity in your schedule as possible. And so it's better to do 
a, a mindful breath, 30 seconds of mindful breathing every day, rather than to cram it all in on a Saturday or to say, I watched a TEDx video on mindfulness. I must be a mindful thing. You know, it's, it's, I use the metaphor of like, you don't eat one salad and say, okay, I'm good for the week, right? You eat a salad every day. You exercise every day. You hug your family every day. That's what practice needs to be like. It needs to be a heartfelt space of that you're investing in yourself on a daily basis. And it's not this kind of heavy thing that, oh, I didn't do it. I'm not a good meditator. So Barth is frozen for just a second. So I'm going to move on to, he may have dropped off. He'll be back. So he, you know, Barth was talking about building a practice just throughout your day. And you mentioned that very thing. So tell us more about that from your perspective of how people can get started simply um, if they're interested in a mindfulness practice. is like how do you how do you attach mindfulness to a habit you already have like you get up and brush your teeth or floss and so how do you mindfully brush your teeth and how do you be present with the way it feels in your mouth the way the floss slides between your teeth and just be really present and that's an old buddhist thing of when you eat eat you know how many of us eat and are doing texting and emails and everything else you know how do you just take that even if it's just five minutes the first five minutes of a meal and then let your mind go crazy but take that first five minutes don't don't try to take an hour of mindful eating in that way um and i just find myself in moments go oh yep michelle told me breathe i can just breathe and so i don't have to step away from my computer i close my eyes I might, you know, turn my monitor off if that helps, um, but I just take three breaths. Uh, one of my favorite things is the five breaths, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, um, and it's just the simple things like that. Uh, and I love walking that Martha Ellen talked about. Uh, walking is one of my favorite things. Yeah, so take it away, Martha Ellen, since you were uh -huh. mentioned. Yeah, I'll just say that um, one of the good things about, uh, I'm an avid exercise workout person, but one of the awesome things about mindfulness is it's free and it quite requires no equipment. It just requires you and your willingness to kind of cultivate your awareness and uh, observe your thoughts and, and kind of get in touch with your emotions and kind of uh, explore the, the, the kinds of things that are surfacing up for you. So being able to Number one, being willing to cultivate um, that whole mindfulness practice and step away from the judging. We are so quick to judge. And that's one of the beautiful things about mindfulness is that it requires us to avoid judging. We kind of push away all those icky, unpleasant thoughts that we, we either may have about ourselves, others may have about us, and in our, in our kind of gets our emotions, um, I'm going to call it more natural. How we, how we should be and more accepting and we just kind of, I feel more awake when I when I do mindfulness and I, I do it, I, I'll trust me, I do it like five or six times a day because depending upon what my schedule is, I definitely start my day, definitely end my day, but depends on the drama that happens throughout the day, I do it as well. So, you know, it's an energizer, it's an awakener, it's a sort of a calmer, I do it lunch breaks, I do it walking, I do it, work, I do it when I work out, all those kinds of things. So. Um, it's really easy, and like I said, it's free. You can just, uh, once you get the, the practice down, you can do it, and it, it'll just jump up, I think, oftentimes. Because once you're used to it, it'll just jump up, and you're not even expecting it. And you'll go, oh, it's time for a mind mindfulness break. Yeah, and when I first started with mindfulness and would step away from work and take those breaks, I actually felt guilty. And I, 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 don't, I don't understand that, but I would think, oh, I should be finishing that email. I shouldn't be taking these deep breaths and calming, um, trying to deal with the stress I'm under. And now I'm, I'm over that. But at first, that was something I felt, in case anyone else feels that too. Michelle, why don't you talk to everyone about starting a mindful practice and what your perspective is? Hmm. I'm just noticing the smiling and the feeling of the muscles in the face. And 
we talk about informal and formal mindfulness practice. And formal is that real intentional, I am going to sit down, I'm going to do the body scan, um, I'm going to do mindful movement, uh, very intentional. And then you have the informal, which is the walking, being in the shower, like he talked about, you know, brushing your teeth. Can we be in the shower without being, can you believe they said this about me in the, the meeting or I've got this to-do list? Can we feel the suds on our body, the water? Can we be in the shower? And I loved how Martha Ellen was speaking, you know, all these opportunities are right in front of us. Can we choose to be present? And so, and I loved how Garth really pulled in giving ourselves permission not to, you know, beat ourselves up, judging ourselves that we, you know, have to do it this way or that way and um, to give ourselves the gift of being present and that we belong. And I love to say mindfulness is love, that we are all loved. And uh, so I always say, if you want to go snork snorkeling where you just kind of skim the waters you know we can we can invite in being present and if you want to go scuba diving and take the deep dike dark cave down into the cave um you can really immerse yourself in an eight-week course and notice what happens and how does that support you and so those are just some different uh ways to hold the space with permission without judgment and I loved how Martha Ellen said, it's free. I always say, you know, Superman has the S on the chest. I always say M, M for mindfulness. <laughs> and we're always carrying it. And this is the gift to wake up to be present in the moment. Right here, right now. There's not some other moment. It's here. And how we give presence to it right now. So thank you. Yeah, so you've heard from everybody, from all the panelists, talking about mentioning at some point or another mindful fed and what, where, where mindfulness is already in government. But I want to think about next, what's the future? So Heath, would you start us off with a discussion about what your vision is for mindful fed in future? <laughs> Ellen's work. Um, there's a, a mindful EPA program out there as well. And so um, I'll start us off and everybody else can chime in about this, but um, Garth introduced it to me in the sense of, you know, and I know Michelle and both Garth get called all the time for how do we how do we start this in our agency? How do how do we get started? We already have a small group. How do we make it bigger? How do we do what you're doing, Michelle? How do we do what Garth is doing? How do we build on this so that we're not little islands alone in the sea scuba diving? But how do we hold hands and and do mindfulness together in all the various ways? And so mindful fed is is the idea of of networking the different things that are happening out there. Um, Michelle offers um, moments on Mondays and Fridays. Garth is offering um, many um, mindful moments and mindful movement now in NOAA. Um, we're bringing in different speakers uh, and sometimes those events can be opened up to a broader community, but because we're siloed, then um, they don't necessarily get uh, out to a broader audience. Mishi ja, Dr. Mishi Ja just came and talked on Mindful Noah. Um, and so Mindful Fed is about how do we bring that together? Instead of us all creating a wheel, how do part of the government create wheels? How do part of us create a buggy? And then how do we bring that together so we're not reinventing, uh, but we're utilizing and um, linking together to create something bigger uh, rather than continue to reinvent the wheel in each of our different silos. So, um, Garth, Michelle, Martha Ellen, what would you add to this idea of what, what would a mindful fed look like for you all? Go ahead, Garth. Sure. Um, 
I just want to reiterate what Kathy said at the beginning, like we're, we're faced with this new world um, and kind of repelled, I think, kind of a long overdue era of holistic health for uh, the workforce. And so these uh, previous mindsets of passively encouraging employees um, to take care of themselves needs to be transformed where agencies are systemically promoting and investing in employee health, uh, making it their responsibility for a holistic, uh, well employee. Um, so I can't stop at the individual. We can't be pointing at the individual and say, take care of yourself amidst all this stuff that's going on in our lives. Um, so we need to be thinking beyond health and resilience of the individual. We have to be thinking about performance and leadership and workplace culture. And so to that end, what Heath is alluding to is that uh, this group and others are envisioning um, the nurturing of a community like we've started in Mindful NOAA, like Michelle started in the Forest Service, a, a community of public employees that um, is interested in enhancing self-learning and growth through mindfulness practices and strategies. And you might think, okay, there's vendors out there that can do that. That's, I think that's the wrong choice. Our success has been because it's been internal and we've created a community of practice that is safe, that ha creates a sense of belonging. And so with these few trailblazing agencies like EPA, like Forest Service, like OPM, like, like us and NOAA, I mean, we've demonstrated success and we need to, we need to break down those silos of, okay, we build ours and you build yours because th that old model doesn't work anymore. And so we have this vision of c coming together collaboratively and saying, what can we do at this economy of scale, tapping into the groundswell of individual interest, and then finding leader advocates that help us move this vision, this concept into actionable items. So that's where we're at the table together right now. And we're inviting anyone who's interested, um, who, who is a change agent in their agency to come to this table with us and help us figure out what our next steps to make this a reality. I would invite- um, Michelle and Martha, go ahead, Martha Ellen. I would invite um, for those that are, that are here today to actually think about what a mindful workplace would look like. And I do this with the PMF um, fellows a lot. So I encourage them to actually, what would that workplace look like? How would you apply focus and awareness? How, when you walked into the office that day, you know, you have awareness of everything you do from the moment you enter that office, what would that look like? And then I also challenge them and I'm challenging you as well, you know, focus on the task at hand. So oftentimes there, you know, we're, we're doing 50,000 things at once. Focus on the task at hand and then I encourage the, the, the fellows, these, these are our emerging leaders. So I take this very seriously because I think, you know, we are creating a, a new workforce in the federal government. So kind of um, when you do mindfulness, you know, it helps increase your effectiveness. It decreases your mistakes and it also enhances your creativity. And that's one of the key things that, that, are, that the young emerging leaders, they, they, they're, they're task oriented, but they don't take the creativity. So would encourage you when you think about um, creating a mindfulness practice within your particular agency, just think about how nice it would be to have a mindful workplace, a mindfulness in your actual workplace, and what that means when you enter the office every day. Well said. Michelle, do you wanna wind up this, this discussion? It's about time for Q and A, but I'd like you to have your chance to add to this. It's so beautiful what Heath and Garth and Martha Ellen just shared. I'm just shaking my head with this huge smile of joy that's exuberating for all of us to be a part of this as a community. I keep thinking of a receptive basin that holds a lake, a water, the ocean. We're all in this together. And so here we are in a world pandemic going in three years. We didn't ask for it. And how we hold this collectively together as leaders, as future leaders, as federal agencies serving the American public and the land. And so what would this platform look like collectively together so that we have the energy to give our best selves all the time and not be exhausted because everyone is just siloed? What does it look like to knock down all the walls in the house and to see throughout the whole house? And thank you so much for letting me share.
Thank you all. Well, we're gonna switch over to the Q&A portion of this because I know I've seen some questions coming in in chat and I'm gonna ask for Katie's help in going through those and selecting out some of the more common questions. Um, so Katie, do you have some that you think that um, you would like to put forward for the panel to answer? Sure, yeah. Um, Karen had a question. Uh, is there a community of practice somewhere for Mindful Fed so everyone who wants to learn or create can network? Jump in, anybody. All right, I'll call on you. Good. Go ahead, hey. What would that look like, um, and how do we get that started? And I believe that was the invitation that Garth was putting out there. That um, I'd love to have other people that are interested in and uh, talking through that and thinking through that. Um, one of the things we've talked about is is having a centralized calendar. If the, if you have events that are open to those of uh, folks beyond your agency, um, to have a centralized calendar that they that we could all go to or just a central place to list. Like I saw um, somebody put in there, hey, is there is there a, a community of practice in the VA? Well, you know, the, um, a community of practice at the Mindful Fed could actually say, here's a list of all the different agencies, communities that you can actually go and belong to. And, you know, some of us love belonging to our own agency stuff, but then other folks love belonging to a community that is cross agency because then we can share ideas beyond our silos and our walls. So that's the piece that we're working on. Yeah, he, you know, Karen, um, Karen A said, can we benchmark or observe how this is done in other agencies to better understand how to bring it back to our own agency? So I thought that was a great follow up to your, to your comment. Um, Garth, what about you? Would you like to answer that one? Yeah, so that I mean, as we build the bicycle, we're trying to figure out, okay, what is our measure of success? How fast we're going? How are we do, are we going in, in together? Do we need to refine the bicycle? So, you know, Michelle and the Forest Service have an amazing benchmark study of what it did for the for um, their tens of thousands of folks. We have a survey that we did in our first year that we're going to be doing again um, this year, and and the 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 numbers are somewhat staggering they put you back on your heels a little bit to see the impact it's having on employees you know upwards of 90 re, percent uh, reporting reduced stress increased focus like 70 percent better able to focus and, and work with colleagues and feel more compassionate to the mindful workplace that martha ellen was describing so we have some local agency things and there's reams and reams of research out there with what's going on in the private sector and so i think the best way that we could do is have one-on-one -on -one conversations with you um, and invite you as leader advocates to the Mindful Fed table to start to organize that research for when we need to brief leaders, those change agents, those people who hold the purses um, to make this a reality, a pro an actual program. Thank you for the question. Yeah, and actually, Patricia asked, do you have evidence to help employers understand the benefit of ensuring mindfulness as part of the workday? And you just addressed that, Garth. And so Michelle and Garth, um, Keith and Martha Ellen, I'm sure could all provide that evidence that, that is helpful as you're trying to set up a program within your agency. Um, Naomi says, um, Michelle, I'm gonna throw this one to you. Please explain and talk about body scanning again. I think Martha Ellen brought it up, but Michelle, I'm sure you're, you're able to describe body scanning and what that is. Yes. So the body scan is a symptomatic way of scanning through your whole body. And we actually start all the way down at the left big toe and we move ourselves all the way to the top of our head. And I can tell you that the first time I was introduced to this practice, I thought, what am I doing? I'm lying here going through this body scan and this and I was with a big group of people at the time. It's now one of my favorite. And a matter of fact, I do it before I even get out of bed every day. <laughs> and so, um, and there's lots and lots of research that's been done on the body scan. That's a lot of the research comes out of what we change and how we grow the gray matter around our hippocampus and we shrink it around our amygdala so we can take better care of our watchdog that is where we store fight or flight. 
and in the stressful situation, our response to our stressors. So that actually is changing our body. Okay. So we're not just doing nothing. We're not just sitting there doing nothing or lying there doing nothing. You're doing everything. And it will be the hardest work you'll ever do. And like I always invite everyone who's taking the deeper dives, going scuba diving, to notice who you are. Because when you get done with a class, you'll be a different person. And if you're okay with that, stay in the class. It's a beautiful question. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Martha Ellen, you, you've used body scanning in your program, you, you had right. mentioned that, I believe, with the, right. with the women's leadership. Right, yeah. Um, I can't say any, any more than what Michelle already said. Um, it's, it's, it's really, uh, I, I use it as an energizer because I really take the time and we've worked with, um, with the women that were in our class. We had them do a body scan before they came to the class and then they, we kind of talked about it. Um, but they, uh, really need to, you just kind of relax and you explore and we I didn't know the big toe thing Michelle so we just started at feet so <laughs> we, but we wanted them to like this really engage their their bodies and what that means because oftentimes you know we we don't we don't do self-care and how we how are we feeling that day how are we coming to the space that we'll be working with we the class was uh five days eight hours a day so how do we come to the class what are we feeling? And then um, ask the participants to share their their, their feelings um, when they first came. And then we were able to support each other in wherever we were when we started the class uh, due to the body scanning. Right. So we have two more questions that we're gonna try to cover before we have to close out. It's gone so fast and I'm sure there are a lot of other questions. Um, but one person wrote, let's see, um, Barb wrote, how do I find out if the Department of Justice has a mindfulness program? Does anyone have that answer for Barb? I, I, can, I can share okay, that I've, I've had uh, your colleagues participate in mindful-based stress reduction. Um, and so I could probably give you some of their contacts. Um, and uh, so maybe there'll be a conversation around that as we come together as a community, um, probably about a 250 employees. Yeah. Okay, Thank you. great. So one, one <laughs> additional question from Brian. He said, um, can you speak to creating this community in our new virtual world? Many of the positions in our organizations have now been classified as full-time remote, some local, of communities other than in the, I guess, um, other than US as well. So virtual, how's it working in the virtual world now? <laughs> Michelle, or go ahead. It's like the virtual world is what allowed mindful Noah to happen. It has only been in the virtual world. And so my question is, how do I bring that into the physical world as people go back into the workspace and we have this hybrid space where employees need to feel safe saying, hey, boss, I'm going to go to the multi-use room and I'm going to practice mindfulness with a group and we're going to have someone on the screen. So it's a very provocative question, Brian, and we have to figure that out together. I think that's the, the power of the mindful fed to, to start to normalize this. And if I might, I'd love to connect this with Karen A's question about the doubters and the detractors. You know, as we move forward post pandemic, um, we have to be able to advocate for this type of thing. And in my two years, I've been sort of surprised that the doubters and detractors did not reveal themselves as I thought they might. And if they do, there's so much research, so much science behind this. It's hard for them to stand behind that doubt and, and dissent. And this is a, a final thought that I'll share. You know, Michelle described used a lot of words that might be off-putting to some people in that like that's not that's too passive that's too lovey-dovey that was 20 years ago and now i approach this with a bit of a ferocity a sense of like this is a fierce hard to do thing a, a place of strength and i think when leader presented with that idea that this is a place of learning and growth that that doubt and that detraction tends to dissolve away but you got to be your own self-advocate and then find those leaders that will work um, in lockstep with you. Kathy, I have a quick uh, story. Right. 
Uh, uh, just a really quick story that I introduced this into our Air Force program briefly, and we got major league pushback from the our Air Force gentlemen. I'll just be very polite. And th they didn't want touchy-feely, this is tree huggery, blah, 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 until they did it. And then uh, the course is a five-day course, and then it got to the point was, I think we need some mindfulness. Can we take a moment? So it was interesting. Once they actually experienced it, it was something that we, we now, they, they asked, actually asked for it. Thank you. I, I think that the panelists would love to hear from the audience in chat, just to know how you see Mindful Fed in the future, once we figure this whole thing out, how would Mindful Fed support you and your agency? If you would like to give us some feedback and put that into chat, we would most appreciate it. But in the meantime, while you're thinking and adding that to chat, um, I'd like to thank our wonderful panelists for being here today. And also thank you, our audience, for joining us and being so attentive and thoughtful in your questions. Um, and before closing, I also want to add that OPM is here to help you. We're here to help your agencies with two of today's most relevant leadership topics in addition to what we've discussed today, and that is fostering DEIA and leading hybrid teams as we all begin to return to the office. So we offer custom workshops for agencies as well as open enrollment courses. And if you'd like to learn more, just visit any of the links here that are posted in the chat or email us at cldconnect at opm.gov. And Katie, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna send it back to you, but if you could just help everyone understand where they, how they can contact our panelists uh, if they want more information, that would be helpful. So back to you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the best thing, uh, I know Garth shared his email in the chat, but um, you can email the CLD connect at opm.gov inbox that you've been getting the correspondence about this webinar, and we can put you in touch, uh, you know, based on what your questions were or any follow up that you needed. Um, and, and yeah, thank you so much, panelists. Uh, I hope everyone, I know I learned a lot today, and I'd like to thank everyone for attending uh, today's webinar. Just wanted to mention um, some other services uh, that the Center for Leadership Development uh, provides, a variety of leadership and professional development for your agency and for you as an individual for courses. So um, you can also visit our website, leadership.opm.gov, for more information on that. And uh, lastly, thanks again for participating and with in the spirit of Public Service Recognition Week, uh, we're so appreciative of what everyone here on the webinar, everyone in the, that's participated and um, all the attendees for what you do every day in service to our nation. And we hope that um, you are able to take back some things to your agency today and uh, appreciate your time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you all.